Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Tis the season for pecans. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, we take a look back at Oklahoma's pecan crop. We start out in the orchard looking at pecan flowers. Becky Carroll then shares with us about native pecans. We then take a look further at the difference between an orchard and a grove. And finally, we close the show as we see the processing of the pecan harvest. Today we are back out here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station and we are standing in the pecan orchard and some might say we're standing in a field of flowers but Becky I don't see any flowers can you help me out here? <laughs> There's flowers everywhere if you take a look into these trees if we'll pull down this branch right here all these um, things that are hanging down uh -huh. these are called catkins they're the male flowers. Okay. And then the female flowers are a little bit harder to see, but they're at the end of the current season's growth. That's the female flower or the pistillate flower. So that kind of bright limey green color. Yep. Is There's where... just little, um, little stigmas that are exposed right there. And just recently, since um, probably Monday, these started to be visible where you can see them. Okay. So all the male pollen has to find its way onto that female pollen yep. in order to get our pecans each season, correct? Yes. And so we want to have our pollen source within about 150 yards of the tree that we're wanting to be pollinated. Okay. So if you're planting trees, you need to make sure that they're planted close enough unless you're around native trees where they might have a pollen source that might uh, come in. But still about 150 yards is ideal. Okay, well I know people that just maybe have one pecan tree in their mm -hmm. backyard and if it's got the male and the female, why does that not work? Why yeah. do we need something different? Pecans are kind of different. They are, they're a monoecious plant. So they have male and female flowers on the same tree. So monoecious means I think same house or, mm -hmm. or something like that. And so we have both the male and female flowers, but they are a little bit different than things like peach or apple where we have a complete flower. Right. These are separate flowers. And so, um, and the thing about pecans is that they have dichogamous flowering where the, the, uh, the male flowers and the female flowers they are not sexually mature at the same time. Oh. So the female flowers may be receptive before the male flowers, which that would be a protogenous type of, of uh, flower. And so I always think of protogenous, it has gen in the middle. So Jenny, the female flowers are receptive first. And then if the male flowers are sending out pollen before the females are receptive, those are called protandrous. And so I think of Andy or Andrew in the middle. And so the male flowers are sending out pollen before the females are ready to be pollinated. Okay, so you want one of both if you, you've got yes. pecans so that they can make sure that you've got pollen when the females are ready yep. and vice versa. Yes, you wanna have an early pollen shed and a late pollen shed. Sometimes they're called type one and type two. Okay. Uh, sometimes protandrous and protogenous so it's kind of a mouthful there uh -huh. but uh, you need one of each okay. and to get a good fruit set so is this more important on cultivars because I know cultivars are you know genetically all the same right if you right. get one particular cultivar right. the next one over is ex exactly the same that's right so when we're when we're laying out an orchard mm -hmm. in a in a commercial setting we want to have about every fourth row as a as a pollinator oh. and so we want to make sure that we're setting that up properly during the planting time and then also think about way down the road when we're thinning the orchard that we're not going to be removing all the pollinators in year 20 or so okay so you have to set it up properly yeah because initially an orchard is over planted right, right? but right. then as those trees grow you have to go out and thin out some them. of your trees right. 
in a native grove, each native tree is genetically different. So you're gonna have good pollination uh, with, with those trees. They're gonna be protanerous and protogenous out in that same area. All right, so that's one of the benefits of having right. a native tree over right. a cultivar. Sure. Okay, well, it's, it's, you've thrown a lot of fancy words at us <laughs> during this I know, segment. I know. But it is interesting to know. And, of course, the female flowers are out on the end. And so right. you can see we have these shucks here. So that's where we're going to find our pecans later in the season also. Right. And whenever we start um, getting, you know, pecans are one of the last thing to start budding out in the spring. Uh -huh. You can always tell a pecan orchard or you're driving down the road and you see a native grove because they're very late to start breaking bud. And, um, but whenever they start breaking or opening up those buds, the catkins will be uh, developing on that last year's wood. Okay. And so we'll have catkin development and the shoot development on last year's wood, which is right here. Uh -huh. And so you can see they're all coming directly off of that last year's growth. It's got kind of that grayer bark to mm -hmm. it, right? And that current season's growth is going to be... Um, it, it'll have primary buds. We can't see them right now, but when this gets to be mature, we'll be able to see primary buds. And then the female flowers, they are born on the current season's growth. So we'll have this new shoot development, and this is where the female flowers are developed. So the catkins are directly on last year's growth, and the female flowers are on this year's growth. So a little bit different, and these are usually not visible until early May, but you can pull your limbs down and see if there's a potential crop even early before they're pollinated. Now, even if you see flowers, that doesn't mean we may, we'll have pecans in the fall because a lot of things can happen between now and um, October or November when we're harvesting. But you can, you can also check when you're, uh, to see if your pollen source is active just by shaking some of these tassels uh -huh. and seeing some of that yellow pollen being released or licking at your flowers and they'll get kind of a sticky substance on there okay. and that's just signaling that they are ready to be pollinated okay and they are wind pollinated is they that are wind pollinated yes uh, insects are not involved in the in the uh, pollination and so if we if we have um, a tree that doesn't have a pollen source it's just out there by itself it may have flowers but it doesn't get pollinated or it may be self-pollinated there are some that will actually pollinate themselves but they'll lose maybe three quarters of that crop and the quality is not as good. Okay. So uh, we would rather have cross pollination if possible. Some trees won't pollinate each other this, the same or themselves at uh -huh. all, but others may have a, a slight window where they can pollinate each other. Okay, so unless you have native, you definitely want to get yeah. more than one yeah. um, different types. And if these don't pollinate properly, mm -hmm. we'll have a lot of pecans dropping on the ground in June. And so we watch for June drop, and that's usually there was some problem with our pollination at that time. Okay. So they didn't get fertilized, and they dropped to the ground. All right. Well, thanks for sharing this information sure. with us, Becky. And sure. definitely, we are in a field of flowers. Oh, definitely. And I know why my eyes are starting to water now. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Sure. <laughs> Most people associate the three sister crops like bean, corn, and squash with the Native American tribes here in the United States. But there's actually a crop that's grown in Oklahoma that may have even a longer history with the indigenous people of the United States, and that's pecans. Uh, pecans are found in, in the wild, native pecans are found from Wisconsin down through Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, a, a little bit of Arkansas, but mainly Oklahoma and Texas. And those pecans are, are growing wild. They're native to the area. They're grown in riparian type of, of soils, very deep and rich uh, river bottoms, and they are um, spread along those creeks and tributaries. And so that's where you find a lot of our native pecan trees and native pecan groves in the state of Oklahoma. And so all the trees that, that are grown in other states like Georgia or New Mexico, Arizona and California, those have all been planted. So we have something special here in the state that we need to recognize and, and know a little bit more about uh, the benefits of native pecans. So I have some examples of some native pecans that were selected from different parts of the state. Some of them are too small to really be uh, useful for production 
but then you can see that they are quite different in size and shape. Each native pecan tree is going to be genetically different from the others. And so that's why we see a lot of differences in, in quality as well. And so for native pecan growers, uh, whenever they are uh, managing their orchards, they need to worry about things like thinning the trees to get enough sunlight into the trees. And then look at fertilization, which can be done by using clovers or conventional fertilizers, but also managing for uh, pests like uh, pecan nut case bear or pecan weevil. But most of the time, if one of their native trees may have issues with scab or other problems, that might be one that they would think about removing in their thinning process rather than trying to spray consistently to keep the, the disease at bay. There are um, a lot of, of different native pecans uh, may have very thin shells. Most people think of a native as being very hard shell, very thick, and very little meat. But, in, but really, there's a lot of them that have thinner shells. Uh, people talk about a paper shell pecan, and a paper shell just is kind of a descriptive word for how thick the shell is. It doesn't mean that it's been grafted or it's an improved variety. It just means that the shell is thinner, and a lot of people use it interchangeably for improved varieties. But if we look at some of the different types of pecans that we use in some of our orchards in Oklahoma and other parts of the country, some of these were selected as natives so they were grown like the Mount. It is a pecan that was in a native grove in around Beggs, Oklahoma on the Mount Ranch. And so it was a consistent producer, had good quality. And so the Mount family selected that pecan, started taking graftwood, sharing it with others. And so now we have that improved variety called Mount. And so some of the others that are listed on here, like Kansa, Lakota, Pawnee, Choctaw, with the Native American names, those were all released from the U USDA. And so they were, went through a breeding process to develop those cultivars. But like Merrimack pecan, it was actually a seedling that was found in Merrimack, Oklahoma. And it was growing in just next to a house there in Merrimack. It was probably a Mahan seedling, but we know that when you plant a nut, the tree that's produced from that nut is not gonna produce identical pecans to the original tree. So you can see there's a lot of different uh, choices in size and shape and how they, um, they, even how they taste. Some of these taste uh, much better than others. I personally like the smaller pecans. They usually have a higher oil content. Like our natives, they have much higher oil content. And right now there's, they're doing some research to look at the health benefits of native pecans versus improved varieties. So some of the varieties like Pawnee or Choctaw, some of the larger nuts will require irrigation. And so if you don't have enough water to produce these pecans and fill them out properly, then growers need to be thinking about growing something smaller like a Kansa. And so availability of water is, is a big issue. And then also a Pawnee versus Kansa, the Pawnee is gonna have much more uh, fungicide applications needed versus a Kansa. And then a Kansa may also even fit into a native grove where sometimes they can graft a Kansa or some of these other smaller nuts into a native grove and they will uh, be easily um, uh, fit into that production system but boost the kernel percentage a little bit on those uh, overall production of those nuts. If you look at uh, what I said about kernel percentage, that means the amount of, of kernel to shell or packing material. So something that's got a very thin shell, something like a, a peruke has a very thin shell, it may be like 60% nut meat or 60% kernel is what we call it. Whereas some of the natives, like these very small ones or some that have very thick shells, may have a 30 or a 35% kernel. So you have less nut meat per pound versus one of these with a thin shell.
I'm excited about native pecans in Oklahoma, and I hope you have the opportunity to try a native pecan and see the differences between it and an improved variety. Check with your local pecan grower in your area, ask them if they have some, or you can forage some for yourself in a park or in a, near a creek bank or somewhere in the fall. Today we are here at a pecan orchard just outside of Skyatook and joining me is Chad Selman with Selman Farms. Chad, a lot of people might think that a pecan orchard is a pecan orchard, but you who are an expert know there's differences. Tell us a little bit about the two different types of orchards we have behind us here. Yeah, so uh, we have an orchard in a grove and a orchard um, is in rows okay. and a grove is sporadic. Okay, we're all pecans, right? It's yeah, all pecans. they're all pecans. <laughs> now, um, the ones in rows are going to be primarily Pawnees, which is an improved variety. Okay. And what we did is we planted those trees. It came up as a seedling or a native tree. And then we grafted that tree, took a limb off of a, another tree, uh -huh. grafted it to that tree that was growing. Okay. And then made it a cultivar. So they have native rootstock, so they do well in the soil here and are adjusted, but yet yes. they have an improved... An improved variety, variety on top, yeah, growing on, top. on the top of the tree. Okay, but then the grove behind you, tell me a little bit about what yeah. that is. So it's a 90% native trees. Okay, so all the way. <laughs> top all the way, bottom. top to bottom. So those are the ones we didn't graft. Okay. They're just there naturally. Uh, all we did was cleaned up a block of woods uh, around them and left the pecan trees. All right. But the you know the nut the difference between the improved varieties and the natives are the natives are a much smaller nut. Okay. And the improved varieties are much larger. So primarily, what you're always seeing are improved varieties at the stores and. Especially when you're wanting those big kernels, yes, right? Yes, 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 exactly. So is one better than the other? Or what? What's the uh, differences, I guess? Is there a flavor difference? Yeah, there's always a great debate between yeah. <laughs> uh, pecan growers which one is better than the other. But uh, um, in reality, uh, the, the one with a higher oil content has a higher flavor, con flavor value to okay. it. And so most of the time, it's generally the smaller nuts have the higher oil content than, rather than the bigger ones. Oh. But... Everybody likes to see, uh, likes likes the bigger ones because they look nice, big, and very pretty, and that's okay. So it's a little bit of the cherry red apple versus yes. the taste of exactly. that apple. Okay, exactly. yeah. So maybe the smaller ones actually have a better flavor for yeah. us. Yeah, which a lot of the, I mean, every all the uh, natives are really used in uh, for confectionery purposes. Okay. Uh, so they're not really you're not going to see that many of them at your farmers markets and stuff like that. So. Okay. Well, what about the maintenance? So obviously these are the cultivars are in nice rows, but your natives are kind of like you said sporadically planted by nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. How does that play with the maintenance on the two? Yeah. So um, on the maintenance, for spraying for the insects are going to be the same insects that. Okay. Uh, feed on them both. Uh, now the difference is the natives are uh, more scab resistant and most improved varieties are susceptible to pecan, pecan scab. There are some that are more resistant that USDA's come out with, OSU and some other um, people have came out with and researched. Okay. Uh, these are Pawnees, which they're very susceptible to scab. And so we'll have to come in and spray these. Uh, during the summer, we'll spray them about every two weeks, uh, starting after bud break and finish all the way into August. All right, so that kind of plays with your costs of production. Yes, and yes. also if, if somebody's looking for something that maybe has had less input on it, they might look for a native pecan. Yeah, a native pecan or uh, there's some, other, like I said, there's other resistant varieties out there that people are planting now rather than the Pawnee. Uh, a lot of guys are planting like a, one around here in, in Oklahoma is very popular as a Kenza. Okay. And that's really growing. It's a great nut, um, it has a great pro flavor profile. It's not going to be uh, your great big giant nut, you know, uh, as it's not one of the biggest ones, but it is a very good nut, a uh, very productive nut, okay. and it's easier to grow. So tell me, I know there's a lot to the setup and layout of an orchard, um, that you plant a lot of trees and then later on have to go thin out those trees. Do you thin the natives ever, or yeah, what so, is that process? Yeah, so on, on the improved varieties, um, you know, we're planting generally on, on 35 foot spacing. Some of them are doing 40s and 45s. After about 20 years, they're gonna be starting to grow where they start getting too much shade and they're shading each other out. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we go into those rows and we take out every other tree. So we're gonna take out 50% of those trees. 
and you're really not going to see much of a production difference between one, one year and that next year because that sunlight is hitting those other trees so much and those other trees are going to produce that much more. Okay. Because if you didn't, your, your production will decline. And uh, once you take them out, your production goes up, you're on the same trees. Right. Same way with the natives. Okay. Uh, that works both ways. So a good rule of thumb is if you can't grow Bermuda in your pecan grove, it's too tight. Okay. <laughs> well, and if you look at noon, you want 50% shade, 50% sunlight. All right. Speaking of kind of what's underneath pecans, I know there's a lot of people that are grazing under pecans now too. Um, tell us a little bit, can you graze with cattle under both native and improved as well? Is, is there yeah, any... so you can. Um, there are guys that do both and some guys that really just graze natives and not improved. But okay. because the improved varieties, uh, you know, we're taking care of them, um, do, have a lot more inputs on them, so we want them to produce their fullest potential. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also chemicals for scab and stuff that uh, have grazing restrictions and stuff like that on there. So it's a little harder to deal with okay. than the native orchard. Also, I would suggest maybe pulling them out before you harvest, mm -hmm. um, especially on improved varieties because the cattle are going to stomp them in the ground <laughs> and they might eat a handful of them too. Yeah, so, yeah. everybody um, loves the pecans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and the, the, you know, the value per pound is more on improved variety as well than the native. Oh, okay. Um, and so that's, that's one of the primary reasons for doing so. Okay, well, and if you don't know which way to go, you just go with both, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Chad, for sharing both of these, both the orchard and the grove with us. Thank you. season long we've been following the Oklahoma pecan crop and today we are here to see how that pecan goes from the tree to our store shelves. As we enter the holiday season I know a lot of people are going to be looking for pecans and joining me today is Jared Miller with Miller Pecan Company. Jared thanks so much for having us oh, today. Thank you for coming. Yeah so we're here up in Afton yes. um, at your storefront but you guys have a lot of product that you sell um, tell us a little bit about how those pecans get from the tree to you guys. So um, we have to we have relationships with growers and everything, and we'll go out to the growers and purchase the pecans there, and bring them into here, and that's where the real process starts of trying to get them put into the bag. So when we bring the super sacks in, the first thing we'll do we'll size them. Um, we'll size them down to a sixteenth of an inch diameter so we can get the optimal crack. Um, we're trying to make as many halves as we can because halves are sought after more than pieces. Once we uh, size them, they'll go to a sanitizer to kill any kind of uh, bacteria, bacteria, E. coli, anything. And, and so then, that's just a large vat that they get Yeah, it's just in, a that... large hot water uh, bin uh -huh. and uh, we submerge them down in there for a period of time and to make sure everything is killed. Okay. And when we bring them out of there, they'll go straight to the crackers and start the cracking process. Well, I know a lot of times the pecans have to be dried down. So let's talk a little bit about the moisture and, and if you're dripping them in water, how does that affect that? So um, the uh, when we do submerge them in the water, that will increase the moisture, mm -hmm. um, which we want to increase it a little bit to crack them to try to get more halves. And afterwards, after they before they go to the inspection room for final inspection, we have to dry them on down and get them down to 4% so they don't mold in a box or a bag or on a shelf. Okay. All right, so then it's off to cracking. Tell me a little bit about what that process so is. So the cracking is uh, really cool machines. They run off air and, uh, and electricity both. And the air is actually what cracks the pecans. Oh. And when the pecans get to a certain rotation in the machine, a little big burst of air will hit a little metal pocket and just crack the pecan. Okay. And so the whole point is to just crack the shell, not the actual nut, yes. right? You want as yep. large as nut as possible. We want to set those crackers just right. Okay, all right. So it, it kind of will divide all of those pieces up then? After they go through the crackers, they'll go up through a sheller, and it's a round turret that's uh, beating the shell off the, uh, okay. off the halves. And then they drop down into a sizer, which will size them into all different size pieces and halves. Okay. And in that process, what's happening to all the shells? How do they get um, out of there? The shells are getting uh, sucked away by air a little bit at each stage. And then we get the remainder of the shells with uh, eye machines um, using infrared technology. And finally, they'll go across the inspection table and still... Still today, a human eye still looks at all of them okay. before they and go in the box. That's, and, and I know even some of those processes, you still have a little bit of shell 
So it keeps getting finer and finer tuned, right? Yes. Is that yeah. We we'll just try to get a little shell out at each step. Otherwise, you, if you try to take too much shell, then you're going to be wasting a lot of your good nut meat. Right. And even some of the pieces that might have a little bad, do you try to get as much good off of that? We as do. Possible? We try to recoup everything we can. Okay. I mean, you can't get everything. You still have mill loss, right. but you try to get it all. But that's how you go from a whole to a whole half to some of these pieces, yes. right? Which yep. are still a little tasty as ever. Yes. So, okay. Um, well, thank you so much. And, and basically then at that point they go into packaging? Um, yes, we'll either package in one pound bags in ours. We package in other, uh, you know, clear bags for other people. Um, we also, our main is uh, 30 pound cases. We sell from one pound to one semi load oh, wow. at a time. So tell us a little bit about your distribution. I mean, you're not just selling to locals here in Afton, right? No, uh, probably 90, 98, 99% of everything we do is wholesale. We're supplying a lot of big confectionaries and other retailers and stuff and grocery stores. Well, thank you so much for sharing this process. And if anybody's not near Afton, make sure you check your grocery store for some Miller Pecan. Thank you, Jared. Well, thank you for coming. Next week, school may be out for the holidays, but we've got another great Oklahoma gardening show full of fun educational segments. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Tulsa Garden Center at Woodward Park, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, Smart Pot, and the Tulsa Garden Club.